Welcome back to Swiss Watch Expo. This is Taking Time with Jonathan and Richard. So today we got something pretty special that was uh, really hard for us to do any sort of research on it and tough. is not really talked about. Stick around. So today we're actually going to be going over Gerald Genta, not just his watches, right. but Gerald Genta. Gerald Genta is a person. Exactly. Which nobody really talks about. It was so tough finding information on it. Yeah. Just, I mean, like anytime you type in, a, you'd have to scroll to page six on Google to find something about other than watches. Everything, yeah. every time you pop, Gerald Genta automatically pops up with it's watches. Like the Royal Oak and the Nautilus. Every that, single time. That's it. Without fail. Without fail. It's, a, it's the one truth in life. <laughs> That it's, like, it's like all he wanted to leave behind is watches. Watches, apparently. Yeah, that was it. But yeah, this, it was very difficult to find anything on him, like his family life, what he, you know, what inspired him, that sort of stuff. It was, it was difficult, but we did manage to find some neat stuff. Yeah. So we're going to share that with you. All right. So he was born 1931. Yeah, 1931. Passed, mm. uh, God rest his soul, 2011. Wow. So he was like 90. So 90. It's, it's a good run. Yeah, it's a real good run. Yeah. So, anyways, let's go over like just his big influences, okay. I guess, and in, in the not just the watch world, but just to, like in general, because it's actually really interesting. And there was a lot of stuff that he actually did throughout his life that surprisingly, I, I don't, I don't know. Unless you dig into this stuff, you're never even gonna yeah. realize. I mean, yeah. I would say I'd say the same. He's probably one of the most prolific names in in the swiss world to me i mean well, I, but for, for certain things design. for certain things but i think he's one of the, in in some cases he's an un, unsung hero where you don't know that he's inspired a piece or you don't know that the design came from him or something like that and you know we'll get into that a little bit more but you know he's he's just one of those people that i think is kind of he's going to go the way of shakespeare after he's gone he's just going to grow in popularity over and over and over again hopefully more people do you know follow suit and you know, give us more information about Gerald Genta. That way, we you know, we have that stuff because he's an iconic figure. I don't, I don't know about that. I mean, the auctions that we're going to talk about later, right, happened while he was still alive. True, so, I mean, anyways, let's get into uh, like his first influence was with Universal Genève. Yes, and the pole router. Right. So, if you guys don't know, I think personally, uh, there's probably the, a few people, especially ones that we work with, right. that think that the pole router is like. One of the bar none, like most underrated watches, period, dot, that nobody talks about mm -hmm. whatsoever. Uh, it was a really cool watch designed Wonderful. for the pole route, actually, flyover. Uh, it's supposed to be like with the shortest distance between, was it England and United States? I think so. I think that's right. Yeah, so, yeah, so it was the, the very first time of going it, so they asked them to design the, the watch that was anti magnetic. As a win over the mm -hmm. pole, right? Yeah, for people that flew that route, especially right. the pilots. Right. Yeah, really cool watch. We don't have it. We don't sell it, unfortunately. But it's you know not being made anymore. Right. Uh, but yeah, really cool watch. And then in around the same time in the fifties, because mm -hmm. that was like nineteen. I don't. That was, was nineteen fifty one. I think. I think that's when he started working there. But it's somewhere around there. I think it's nineteen fifty one is when he designed that, or, or that's when he graduated school. But I think it was probably around 1954, 55-ish, whenever okay. he did help, helped them design that watch. So it was like 1958 whenever he designed. He actually was commissioned for the first time mm -hmm. by Patek. Right, exactly. And he yeah. did not design the Nautilus. He designed the Elisp. Yes. So, one yeah. Of the, one of the lesser known, like when you think of Patek, you think of the Nautilus. I think a lot of people sleep on this watch. This was one of the first creations as a commissioned artist or designer that was ever created by Joe. Yeah. Dupin. And I mean, it's still being made by Patek, I believe, today. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's just like you would never, ever, ever, ever suspect that. No, you wouldn't. But it does have the integrated bracelet, which he's known for yeah. very much. And it um, does have the like oblong shape or right. just unconventional shape to the watch case, which is pretty synonymous. Right. He doesn't go for just a round shape anymore. Right. No, no. He goes for, you know, depending on. Well, he did have his periods of industrial type design. Right, yeah. But yeah, anyways. Um, 
Yeah, it's got the hallmarks there. It does. I uh, think it's sort of the, like the beginning. You can see like he gets into the octagonal shape, but you can kind of see how this can formulate into that. You know, as he as he continues his progress is becoming like learning his own as to being a designer. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's yeah. simple in design as well. I mean, it's very simple and clean. Yeah. So it wasn't until like the late sixties. Yeah. Uh, which part? Like sixty six seven plus kind of thing. Yeah. When did he he started his own company? Nineteen sixty nine, I think. And that was the watch company. Yeah. That was so. It. That was his his name, Gerald Genta Watch Company. Yeah. He literally started his own watch company, mm -hmm. which is crazy. Right. So another weird fact about this guy is that this guy actually claimed that he designed over a hundred thousand different designs for right. watches over the course of his life. That's a lot of drawing <laughs> and painting. Yeah. <laughs> One time. And uh, I remember when I was doing my research that his company, like, he didn't outsource no. a whole lot. Yeah. He designed the the case, the dial, the movement. Right. I mean, like, obviously he would need to outsource because he didn't own his own steel mill or right. gold furnace or anything like that. So, like, he would need to source the parts, mm -hmm. but any of the design, any of, like, the, the engineering process. It was, like, all, it was all him. Yeah. Yeah. Which is crazy. Yeah, and he did a few. He did a few pieces for very exclusive clients. Mm -hmm. um, where it's super, super, super complex. It's claimed that at that point in time, he'd made the mo the world's most complex wristwatch, and that was the. Well, let me see if I can get this right. Um, it was the Grand Grand Sonier Retrograde. Sonere. 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 Yeah. And it was just a whole lot of complications all in one. It was a magnificent piece. Check it out. Maybe we can put it on the screen. But if you haven't seen it. Yeah, so, so much. it's essentially yeah. like a perpetual calendar, minute repeater. Oh, yeah. Yeah, designed completely by him. A whole lot of bang in one case. Yeah, and it was like a two jump million. hour. Yeah, and it was a $2 million price tag. Well, that was whenever he, they auctioned, auctioned it. it. Yeah, we'll yeah that was later on. We'll, right. we'll get into that in oh, a yeah. minute. But yeah, so... <sighs> 70s he designed the Royal Oak. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't obviously have the first generation D serial kind of... Royal Oak, but right. this is, you know, a modern representation of that. Right. He essentially uh, was commissioned by Audemars PA AP to design something very industrial that right. would, you know, upscale steel watches in general, which mm -hmm. steel wasn't looked at yeah. as luxury at the time. Uh, you know, the watch industry was going through what's called the quartz crisis. Uh, it's a big revelation where battery powered watches came into effect and essentially... Almost destroyed mechanical watches for good. Right. Right. Um, so yeah, yeah. You're, you're right. He believed he had a he had a mantra that stainless steel watches can be just as equally as valuable as precious metal watches if designed appropriately. Um, so he was actually commissioned, I believe. You know, some people say it's it was a day. Some people say it was a weekend. So one way or another, no matter how you slice it, the watch was created in about 15 hours in a single in a single stint, so to speak, uh, from the time it was commissioned by the time it was delivered. Um, and you know now look at it now it's probably the most well known one of the mo most well known watches in the world yeah and then yeah. he was commissioned by Patek a few years later to do the Nautilus, the Nautilus which we and don't have but we did we have had them we did but anyways we just did uh, a video on it too long I think yeah <laughs> uh, so essentially what he did that in like fifteen minutes on a napkin or something like that yeah in a restaurant and apparently yeah. as the story is told um, the the owners in leaders of Patek were in the same restaurant. And so he literally asked the waiter for a pen and paper and drew the whole thing out in 15 minutes, and handed it over to the guys and voila, one of the most famous watches in the world. Yeah. <laughs> Again. <laughs> it's crazy. You know, I'd say, you know, you might think that the success happened that, that, that fast, but I don't think it did because an artist practice all day, every day. And, you know, he's got a hundred thousand plus concepts and drawings and things like that. He was probably prepared for the moment he was, by the time this happened, this is uh, this is it wasn't just serendipity. It was preparation, preparation met opportunity, and bam, that's. I, I don't know about that. I mean, yeah. artists kind of. I mean, his whole mentality was, you know, don't be constrained, right? You know, freedom and all that kind of yeah. like vibe. Yeah, he's uh, like my spirit animal, man. Because you know, I I, my, <laughs> I value my freedom more than anything else in the world. Yeah, and so he did too. He was actually acclaimed uh, by his own by his own testament that he didn't like wearing watches. And the reason he didn't like it is because he said a watch is the antithesis of liberty. It 
can, it takes away freedom. It constrains you. It binds you. Yeah, it binds you. Like it, it, it gets, it takes away the, the the element of creativity and freedom, because it gives you a, it gives you parameters. It sets, you know, sets guidelines and boundaries and things like that. Which as an artist, you just didn't like. But so, watches are art. They are art. And he made art. He did of, make art out of watches. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, yeah. Another cool thing. He actually attained that uh, special license. Oh yeah. Nin with Disney. Nineteen eighty. 80s, I think it was 1980 he got that license from Disney. Yeah. So he actually attained a license with Disney to actually make Disney watches with right. like Mickey Mouse, uh, Donald Duck. There's several. Very, like he included his own designs yes. with like the retrograde jump hours and right. stuff like that. Uh, really cool watches. They actually, in the 80s, I remember seeing when I was looking this stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> These watches in the 80s were $3,000. Yep. <laughs> $3,000 in the 80s. Okay. Just to get you in perspective, I think a Ferrari was like $20,000. Right. <laughs> Whole different ballgame when it came to pricing. That's a lot. That's a lot of change. I mean, Jesus. He made, he made good pieces. Though. The one thing is that those, those pieces weren't really accepted by the, which, the Swiss watchmaking world. Because uh, he had he had debuted them in 1984. At one, I, I'm I'm going to mess up the name of this uh, the trade show, so I'm not going to try to screw it up. But uh, he went to a trade show with these watches, and the curators of the trade show actually came out and told him he needed to take them down from the display because they didn't think that it matched with the elegance of Swiss watchmaking. So they told him he needed to take it down. So he just packed up his toys and went home. <laughs> he kicked himself out of the show. He's like, you know what? You know, the same thing. He he valued his freedom. The idea, you know, when how does a creator of a show who doesn't make watches get to come out here and tell me how to create my masterpieces. So he took his stuff and he left. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And he was at that, at that point in time, he was, he was huge, he yeah. a huge name in the industry. So it's like, you know, I'm just, he just huffed on out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what else? Uh, let's see. Um, I think the, you know, we, two things here. We haven't gone over the Cartier Pasha. I think in 1985, Cartier, they'd already made the Pasha by now. Uh, that, that, that was around since the 30s or so. But Cartier asked them to reinvent them. Um, so this is obviously a modern rendition of it, but essentially this new case design. And you can see it. Uh, you know, Some of the characters are still there. I would probably call this a little out of shape in terms of what you typically see from the Genta line. But you still see it's got the integrated bracelet, very simple in design. Yeah, um, and it's got that industrial type feel. It does. I yeah. think this one still it still it's has different that. than Cartier. Yeah, it's definitely different than Cartier. Who typically, you know, the tank lines, which are very simple in design, super readable, easy. This is this just has that 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 different approach. So, uh, this is one of his uh, one of the ones that he's created that might not be known for. He also is rumored. We have this out here. If you know for a fact, let us know. The, it is rumored that the Rolex Oyster Quartz was created by him as well. Now, Rolex is real finicky about giving anybody any credit outside of Rolex. So it's very Rolex possible. Is Rolex, and Rolex is Rolex, period. And it may be one of those situations where, like, if you're a scientist working under the dime of a university, you don't get the claim it. The university gets to claim it. So this may very well be one of those situations where this was his design, but he just doesn't get to stamp his name on it. Now, if you obviously you look at it next to the other ones, it's at, at the very minimum, it's absolutely inspired. It's absolutely inspired. Um, likewise, he has some inventions, uh, creations in Omega as well, um, lesser known, the C-shaped case and the pan, the, the pie pan dial, which for the, constellation. for the constellation. Yeah. So that, and that's, those are a little bit lesser known, or maybe he was more or less a part of a team that created, or maybe he was the full stylist or the designer, but you know, that's, I think the jury's still a little bit out on that. And then, you know, so, uh, the other thing that I found out that was kind of neat, I did get to see an interview with his, his wife which was the closest personal experience that I was able to read up on him. He was super passionate about ladies' watches. Because at that point in time, we talked about this before, ladies' pieces were originally, like, watches were originally created for ladies' as yeah. jewelry. But then sort of the industrialization of war and things like that led to more masculine pieces, and, you know, that kind of permeated the, the industry. And then that's what we led to, is more masculine pieces. And then at that time, what they were doing was just downsizing those same watches in creating the same men's watch in a lady's shape and size. And so what he was passionate about was putting design elements into ladies' pieces and making it more of a decorative item. So he actually loved designing ladies' pieces, which we don't, you don't hear about that a lot. Yeah. You don't hear about that a lot. Interesting. But after that, actually, so 
When, when did he sell the company? This, the company's like gone. 2000, whenever Bulgari, I guess. Bulgari right. actually, the, the uh, watch and jewelry company, mm -hmm. uh, Bulgari acquired Joe Tenta right. watches because mm -hmm. he actually designed the Octo right. before Bulgari acquired yeah, and it. And that was under Gerald Genta's name. Yeah. And then he did the Bulgari Bulgari. He did design that before, I think, he was the, the, the Bulgari purchased him. He designed the Bulgari Bulgari. And then well. they bought his company. Yeah. Okay. And, and then they imp implemented the Octo. Uh, Into their line. Exactly, yeah. Which it didn't pick up steam until like 2019, whenever they revamped it. Yeah. So. And then that new one is just, it's one of the hardest things to get. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and then after that, he did Charles. He did Gerald Charles. Charles. Charles Gerald, yeah. I think it was Gerald Charles. He 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 kind of he preferred. It Gerald. was another watch company was, that he founded. Yeah, and so he did that. Did that for about eleven years or so, and then he he passed away with that still going. But in that time, he finally came back to his true passion, which was painting. painting. He liked to paint. Mm -hmm. If you guys are interested, go. It's hard again. Yeah, it's it's hard, hard to find. And it's abstract, and a lot of it is watches actually. Yeah, and like the Royal Oak design. Yeah. It's Crazy. He's got a ton of them where it's got like the Royal Oak. And then he's got his own retrograde. Yeah. Perpetual calendars. And it's really neat. Yeah. It's really neat. You guys should check it out. All right. So, so do we do the same thing and kind of actually, you know, we didn't focus on the watches that much this time, but so we'll probably not do what's your favorite. Yeah. You know, so but this is more about Gerald Genta. This is more about Gerald Genta. Yeah. But we've enjoyed doing this. If you guys got some more information, feel free to put it in the comments because we could always use more. This is a really cool story from one of the most I mean, from a very, from my perspective, a very iconic human being, somebody I think will, you know, last the test of time. So yeah. let us know what you thought and, you know, put Penny in the comments as always, just always. And then what, anything else? All right. Like, subscribe, give us a call. Oh yeah, that email part. Email me. Yeah. yeah. Email, call. Yeah. Penny. And we'll catch you next time on Taking Time.